All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Diaz, the sustainability planner for the city of Bowie, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of our sustainability webinar series. This episode is actually a bonus in honor of Pollinator Month here in Bowie and in honor of National Pollinator Week, which was last week. So we figured maybe some of you might be interested in a 101 or a crash course on what pollinators even are. So uh, who better to walk you through it than Sam Drogi, a local USGS Patuxent Research Center biologist and native bee expert. Sam works with members of our green team pretty regularly and is somewhat of a celebrity here with the pollinator loving crowd. So uh, I'm gonna let Sam get started, but just a quick reminder to stay on mute and place your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them shortly right after the presentation. I'll jump in uh, with any, if you have any questions. So with that, over to you, Sam. I'm unmuted now. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and I'm going to, uh, let me just predicate the whole talk by saying that I am going to be speaking mostly about bees because they do the heavy lifting. Anything that touches a flower is potentially a pollinator. So we have uh, different kinds of systems out there. So some can be done by wasps, the tropics, it might be bats, um, butterflies a little bit. Not, butterflies are not great pollinators. Uh, beetles can be significant. Um, so but uh, we're, but bees do, you know, let's say most of the pollinating. That's what I'm going to concentrate on. I'm really going to make this a stripped down, tiny little talk. We're going to skim across the surface. It'd be like me giving a talk about birds. Like I'm in 15 minutes, I'll let you know everything there is to know about birds. That's not going to happen. Bees are way more complicated. So let's just drop in and it'll be fast. And let's see. There we go. Okay. There's about 4,000 different kinds of wild bees in um, North America, North of Mexico. You get in the tropics, you get even more, 20,000 worldwide, 450 species, different kinds of species of bees in Maryland, PG County, 300 or so species have been documented more usually every year. Any yard in PG County has access to 100 species. Whatever that yard or property is though, um, the bees may fly over if you don't have the right specs. So their specs are all about plants, as we'll find out. Okay, let's just talk honeybees for one second. So honeybees are not like our native species. Honeybees are actually a domesticated insect in a way. They're not native to the region. And if all you know about bees is something about honeybees, then you don't know anything actually about our wild bees because none of that honeybee stuff occurs in our wild bees. Very different system. Too bad we don't have very much time or I would tell you more, but they are not like honeybees at all. Let's put it that way. So, and, and really, literally anything you know about them, you can just say that's not what's going on in our wild bees. I'm gonna show you slides here. These are all public domain pictures. We have a catalog of 5,000 plus. You can download them and use them in any way that you want. At the end, you'll see our um, information on how to, um, you know, our access points, and you can email me to my email will be there. Um, so I'll give you the name a lot of times of these species in the slide, but I'm not going to talk about them. So every bee requires that their babies are fed pollen. Pollen is always a limiting factor, and therefore flowers are always a limiting factor. So all bees are dependent on pollen and therefore are very dependent on flowering plants. So saving bees is saving flowering plants in a lot of ways. Um, and because this is of a concern, bees do not defend flowers. So if you put in flowering plants of whatever kind you have bees on them, it's not a stinging issue unless your little darling grabs a bee and puts it in their hand. And then it's like a crapshoot because about half the bees don't sting at all, wild bees that is, and then the males don't have stingers to begin with, so they can't sting you either. So it's really a very um, unrisky thing to have uh, flowering plants around, even if there's bees there. So most bees nest in the ground, okay, very unlike honeybees, and they're single moms. So one female makes one nest, usually in the ground, sometimes in stems of plants, and then provisions that with a bunch of pollen and nectar. And literally, and they don't defend their nests either. So because there's tiny, most of the size of a grain of rice, and um, what would they do against you, for example? So you literally every day are stepping on or near um, bee nests in your yard, in your 
um, gravel driveway, in um, the lawn, in your garden beds, they're nesting there. You don't know it because they don't defend their nests and they're so small and they hide their nests really well. So they may only go in and out a few times a day. So I should also point out that no one is allergic to wild bee stings, even if they were able to sting you. Again, most cannot. So um, it's again, we ratchet down the issues. And this is why almost nobody knows anything about wild bees. They're not providing honey, remember, not a honeybee. They're also not a threat in terms of like, they aren't sending people to the hospital, yet they're doing almost all the pollination. So they have this great benefit, but we've just said, we're fine as long as our plants get pollinated, we don't need to look closely. But now, because things are a little shaky out there in the environment, we need to look a little more closely because no bees, a lot of these plants disappear too. So it turns out, right, over time, 250 million years, that things have gotten a little complicated. So it turns out that most bee, most of our wild bee species are pretty picky. They don't just like grab any old pollen from any old plant, flowering plant kind of thing. So a lot of them are only going to a few species of plants and pulling the pollen and nectar from them, ignoring everything else, period. So if you don't have the right plants, you don't have those bees. Here is just a few examples. We have lists of these and we have websites with this information in detail, but here's just some surprising things. So this list of plants on the left-hand side, again, no time to talk about them, is just some of the surprising kinds of plants that have bees that are highly specialized. Only go and take the pollen from prickly pear, morning glories, pickerel weed, ground cherry, whatever it might be. And if you don't have those plants, those particular bees, gone. So it's a system that's very balkanized. Lots of bees have divided up the flower world. I'm only going here. And the plants on their part have decided that they are interested mostly only in a subset of all the uh, bees and they're gonna work with them, right? Because they're the most efficient ways for them to move their pollen around. Um, so the average bee flies around outside for about five weeks. The rest of the time it's underground or in their nest from the previous year where mom laid their egg and put in, gave them a bunch of food to live. So a lot of bees are coming and going throughout the year because it's rough when they start flying. Male bees don't have a stinger. We sort of alluded to that earlier and their only job is to mate. So the world is run by the women bees, okay? So they're putting things um, and creating nests, they're digging the nests, they're provisioning and finding the pollen and the nectar and creating all that for their young. The males, worthless, and except for a very small contribution. 25% um, of the bees uh, of the female species of bees that are out there can't sting you. In other words, they have a sting, but it's so wimpy that it can't even penetrate your skin. The reason is for most bees, people are not a problem mammals are not a problem. Their nests are too tiny and small and provide almost nothing for like, why would anyone dig, bother to dig up something that's about the size of a period, you know, in terms of eating that. So their problem are other insects. So they're weaponized for a completely different system. Again, pointing out to bees, wild bees are not a problem. You know this because you know nothing about them because they've never been a problem. So you know about all the super stingy wasps and things because they have, have, uh, have hurt you and your children. Wild bees have not. So who? it's another bug out on the environment. Um, very common one though. So saving bees, to reiterate what we were just talking about, saving bees is about saving and planting native flowering plants. So we're gonna talk about why native, why not just like go to the big box store and get any old flower? Well, the, and the emphasis would be on for technical reasons, which we don't have time, native perennials and shrubs. So not so much the native annuals, not so much the native trees. They have their roles though. We could talk about it question and answer if you want. And um, amounts, so it only takes five flowers really to produce on average, to produce enough pollen and nectar to feed a baby bee. They're very efficient, right? Because they are exothermic. They don't have to generate their own heat. Uh, they need very little energy and pollen and nectar full of energy. So it doesn't take many flowers to produce a bee, which means actually uh, there are thousands and thousands, millions, 
In fact, in Maryland, it's probably trillions of bees out there every year supported by flowers. All right, let's get into, let's get real here. So lawns, think about lawns. There is basically almost no benefit to bees. Like nature does not create lawns. People create lawns. And the objective of most people is to eliminate everything but grass. Grass is not providing flowers, does not provide pollen and nectar, therefore no benefit to bees. One thing you can do if you have lawn and are dead set on keeping that lawn is adding clover to that lawn component or just not bothering to add weed killer and all the other poisons you might think about to create at least a little bit of floral composition, mow a little bit higher. Okay, so now let's get into say municipality level things with Ashley will follow up on and influence the maintenance department at the city. So basically things to think about is why, why are you mowing all this fill in the blank? So a lot of times, for example, uh, a, and I see this in Bowie all the time, but I see it everywhere, is you mow right up to the edge of the woods, right? So let's say it's a park, one of the many different kinds of ballparks out there. Of course, you can't have to mow the, the middle because that's where people are, but no one is hanging out at the edge of the woods. So there's, and also it, it looks too abrupt. You need to feather those edges. And the idea is very simple from a maintenance department point of view. One mower deck gets uncut throughout the year and then you cut it in the, oops, my uh, thing automatically goes forward. One mower deck and then you cut it once a year. These are the kinds of things you can think about adding in into different places that um, add, I think, an aesthetic component of not such an abrupt transition to forest. You can, they can be planted or not, flowers will be there anyway. And you can also think about, okay, we have some areas that we traditionally mow, but no one really goes there. Say the back parts or pockets in the uh, park of open lands, mow those once a year, mow them once a year in the winter and allow the bees and other wildlife to use that field. You don't want that to turn back to woods because we actually have re reasonably amount, large amounts of woodland areas in the buoy area. We want more fields because that's the missing component. These edges, we either mow it or we let it grow to trees. We need some fields and the flowers that come with them because again, you have bees that are only going to those field types of flowers. If you don't have fields, you don't have those kinds of flowers, you don't have a whole big component of your bees. Um, but you still need to be neat and tidy, right? So that's not the message, which is like stop mowing everything and um, get everyone all riled up about how it looks like you've abandoned the city or your yard. Everything that's man-made needs to be edged. So sidewalks, street edges, paths, buildings, planted beds, you want a neat and tidy trimmed area around that. Everything else is um, something that people um, have options. So. Um, People, as long as you have the man-made objects and your houses and buildings are really defined by um, grassy edges, the remaining areas can be um, naturalized in lots of different ways from formal plantings to just, we're just gonna let those interior areas grow with some nice paths through them. That's acceptable to the public as long as it looks, basically it has to look like you did it on purpose, whatever it is. They don't necessarily get all uptight about what's in the remaining areas that are unmowed. So there's options all over actually. So we talked about this feather the edges, you know, move from lawn to something else in a gradual way rather than big sharp angles. Uh, and then, you know, at, you would just automatically do this removing invasives because invasive plants because they're competitors with their native plants. They provide little in terms of pollen and nectar that's useful to the bees that are most of most conservation concern. There will be bees on them, um, just like there's bees on um, some of the plants that you buy from the big box stores, but they're basically the crow and sparrow bees. They're going to be fine anyway. Those invasives don't provide the special um, nectar and pollen that a lot of the less common bees, which you can have in your backyard, um, provide. So it's just some examples here of systems. These would be existing systems. You could recreate them, but already in some of your remaining natural habitats um, in the region and in the town, you have um, these kinds of places. You would want to think about augmenting them or keeping them from becoming overrun by invasives. Spring woodland flowers. 
So more of that is better. There's some deer issues that have to be dealt with there because what does a deer love but spring woodland flowers? So deer management has a positive effect on the uh, bee populations. Um, ericaceous shrubs, um, what are those? Those are things like uh, blueberries, cranberries, um, huckleberries, um, mountain laurel, um, azaleas. That's that group. Lots of very specialized bees on those systems. Fall composites. Um, and these are just three examples really of systems. Things like goldenrods and sunflowers and daisies and that group has an, is another big important component for bees. And of course, if you mow a couple times, even a couple times during the summer, those fall composites are like toast, right? Because you just mowed them and they haven't even bloomed yet. So you want your mowing, if you're going to set things aside for fields, be in the winter you know, even a little bit late winter is good because now the birds would have access to all that seed. But, you know, best thing just somewhere in winter. Um, so quality flowers matter. So we talked about this native plants. So um, non-native flowers. So just think about there's a long list of things that you might see everywhere, a lot of which have zero benefit to bees. So think of pansies. Pansies provide nothing because basically tea roses, a lot of the things that have been bred for like a billion years, begonias, whatever else, the most common indestructible plants in the world have had all their pollen and nectar removed essentially by the plant breeders um, because they don't need it. It's propagated vegetatively, so they put that energy into something else. I uh, talk keeps moving on itself. Big box pollinator seed mixes. So those are the kinds of things you would go into Lowe's and, and there would be, you know, your packet of pollinator seeds. They're okay. You know, they will provide pretty plants that are easy for the manufacturer of seeds to grow, but they are sort of like saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to save birds. I'm, I'm interested in bird conservation of all those rare birds and things like that. And your solution is putting up bird feeders, right? So it's the same kind of thing. Yes, you get more birds. Yes, you get more bees, but they're the crow and sparrow bees. So we're looking at quality native plants. So saving the bees here, we're wrapping it up. Saving the bees means saving the plants, okay? In this case, we're going to be talking about the local rare, not even rare, the local wild plants. And um, ooh, I didn't complete this thought on the other things. And saving the bees, that's because I couldn't find the does not equal sign in my um, PowerPoint talk. Um, symbols set. Saving the bees does not equal saving honeybees. Just again, we don't have a lot of time here, but the solution uh, for honeybees and wild bees is not bringing in a lot of honeybees. It's um, problematic at a couple of levels. So it's really the solution is plants and what gets planted, including in people's yards. And I should have mentioned this. That's the end of what I have to say, because it's not something that we deal with in our little you know, Rosy Hill Wildlife Refuge area is um, all that Mosquito Joe kinds of um, spraying that goes on. That is bad news for bees because if you spray pesticides for mosquitoes during the day, you're killing everything, right? There is no such thing as something that kills mosquitoes, but does not kill, uh, that's, a, that's sprayed, that does not kill everything else. So they will tell you, I'm just telling you, they will tell you that, oh yeah, this is, this is, doesn't hurt bees. That is wrong. So that's the end of my talk. I, you know, no advocacy here, of course, but um, Ashley, so do we want to do questions or what do you want to do? Yeah, um, no one submitted any yet. Um, okay. Feel free uh, viewers to submit, but I have some for you if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so morning glory, is that evolvulus? Um, convolvulus. So, um, so that's an interesting one. Um, oops, I guess my talk will just disappear now. Actually, I can go to put that back up. Um, I don't know why it advances on its own. There's some something I've forgotten. But um, so morning glories as a group are interesting. So Ipomea, um, the particularly Ipomea pandorata, and Ipa, there's another Ipomea which I can't recall. Are um, manroot is the one name for our, our native. And then there's a whole slug of non-native um, morning glory things in, in the convolvulaceae, whatever it is, 
of family and um, bindweeds and other things that are similar, and including the stuff that you might buy at the store. Um, so it turns out different of uh, different specialist bees are differently picky about that. So some um, uh, only go to the native uh, morning glories. And they also, interestingly, why does the morning glory only bloom in the morning? Because native bees are out that are its favorites in the early morning hours before the other bees get up. Most bees don't really get going until nine or 10 in the morning, not morning glories, right? Yeah. Evening primrose, super similar. Right, as the evening pr primrose bloom in the evening, it's because there's a whole set of bees that only come out in the evening hours, and they, um, you know, they're the special friends of evening primroses. So there's a lot going on, including poisonings and uh, special foods and um, uh, repellents and things in the plant world. So it's a long-winded story to say that um, some, a couple of the specialist bees don't care what kind of morning glory it is, and others are like only the natives. And okay. that's, it's a complicated world out there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have a few questions here. Um, Logan's asking, are there any local stores that you know of and can recommend where we can purchase native plants instead of the non-native species and annuals and things at big yeah. box stores? So in a very general way, you can type in um, native plant sales or native plant nurseries into Google Maryland, and you'll find uh, there, at least there used to be a whole set of listings. Locally in Rosaryville is the um, Maryland Native Plants Society. I know, I can't remember. Anyway, Rosaryville in PG County has a really great group and they have a whole series of sales. They did different things in COVID, so I'm not sure how it's working now. Um, through an, um, sales during the year and you can put in orders and they do straight natives. In other words, they're taking seeds from the local environment and raising plants. So these are local vars or um, things of genetically um, uh, regional um, specimens, I think almost all from PG County. So there they would be the best. And um, you can also uh, grow your own, so to speak. It's not too difficult to gather seed and um, and raise plants, you just, there's a, you know, a couple things you have to do, but it's not hard. Um, and um, then there's some other, uh, a whole variety of Washington DC and Baltimore nurseries. Herring Run up in Baltimore comes to mind as a great nursery for native plants. Um, Earth Sangha in I think Alexandria is another really, really good one. And then I believe a number of the nature centers have sales um, each year. So it's on the internet. Cool. Thank you. Um, Bob is wondering, what are the most endangered bee species and what exactly can we plant to help it? I guess maybe if you had to choose a number one. Right. Well, tricky because so little is known about bees. We're not even sure what the most endangered ones are. Um, we do know that bumblebees as a group have a lot of problems because of introduced pests from Europe. So they have these um, very strange pathogens that have whacked a bunch. In fact, the only endangered species of bee in the lower 48 is a bumblebee that um, was so crushed by these diseases that it's gone from almost all of its range. Used to be, in fact, in the DC area, we've had them on the refuge, gone now. Um, so, but if I were to say planting wise, um, hmm, I think I would look at, first of all, I would look at what a, um, a shrub um, called Lyonia. I think it's Fetterbush is the common name. So L-Y-O-N-I-A. And there's a couple different species. They're quite lovely. They're, they're in that ericaceous thing. You would love to have it in your, um, in your yard. It just is a pretty bush, but they have bees that only go to it. And it's become more and more difficult to find that in the wild. We have some on the refuge. And we have some of the bees that come to it. So having more of that bush in, in buoy would be a great thing because the, the bees are constantly dispersing out. And so um, if they found a bush in um, buoy, they'd be like, that's cool. You know, they're, they're not into redlining, like, oh, we don't do buoy or whatever it is. So they'll, you plant it and they will come basically. I would say that and, um, um, there's a, uh, well, 
Ashley, if you remind me, I can send you a link that has all the um, specialist bees on them. Um, so I'll stop I can, there because it goes, it, I can go on and on about the different groups of uh, plants and bees. But Ionia, I think that's a one that could be easily incorporated into uh, most suburban yards, but is not right now. Um, and so Elmer's asking, Elmer says, everyone talks about saving native perennial stems over winter. Why and what size stems and how to do it neatly? Ah, okay, so actually this is a big gardener thing. I didn't realize this, but um, so there's a notion that bees use the hollow stems of perennials um, or sometimes shrubs like brambles um, and they're nesting in there and that if you cut them down in the winter, you're killing a whole bunch of baby bees. So um, a couple of things. One is bees, most bees, except for carpenter bees, really, the rest of the bees can, can, can't uh, penetrate those um, stems. So their jaws are so weak that they actually can't even drill into the stem of a goldenrod or something like that. So they require a broken end of some kind or a browsed end or a, a cut end. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the short answer is don't worry about it, right? If you need to neat and tidy it up your uh, perennial gardens in the uh, fall, that's fine. Just leave about eight inches of stem uncut at the bottom, right? So now you've actually created habitat because you've opened up the uh, stem. They now have access to those the next spring and they'll nest in them and uh, yeah. produce a round of young. Um, and um, you can do that um, with wild plants and stuff too. Um, particularly another particularly good place is to do is if you have blackberries or uh, raspberries, you know, usually you're managing those by cutting out the old canes. Don't cut them all the way to the ground. Cut them again about eight inches up. And even though they might not be hollow, they have pith in them. There are certain bees that want to nest in open soft pith too. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Liz says, could you say something about which native trees support bees and how? Yeah, so, um, so some trees are wind pollinated. So all, and always, there's always exceptions, right? So oaks in general, and almost certainly are all wind pollinated and are really not gonna provide much of anything in terms of pollen that's usable to bees because the pollen is designed to float on the wind and not be, and um, a usable piece of pollen is coated by the plant with all kinds of proteins, lipids, and fats that would then support a baby bee. So oaks do not. And then there's a whole series of other things like ash and hickory that are also in that category, wind pollinated. This, this all, you, if you have a question, you can look it up on the, um, on the internet. Um, the, anything that has a noticeable flower um, is going to be pollinated by insects. In a few cases, like magnolias are pollinated actually by beetles, um, but in most cases, they'd be, if you have a flowering tree, a tulip poplar, even though you don't see the flowers very much, way up top is uh, are flowers with buckets of nectar in them. And that supports quite a, quite a number of bees. Um, and um, so I would say, you know, black loc, there's a lot actually, black locust. Um, a really cool one is um, chestnut. And we're not so certain about Chinese chestnut, but American chestnut, which you now can obtain because they backcrossed it enough, supports many bees with its pollen um, and blooms uh, fairly late in the year. Black gum, another really good one, also very, I think, sharp looking tree. It would be high on my list. Um, American holly, um, and again, you have male and female American hollies. Uh, both would be good. The male, of course, is providing pollen. Um, which is more in demand, um, can it be just swarming um, with bees? That's a generalist sort of system there. Um, so red maple, boring old red maple, um, produces a lot of pollen and nectar early in the spring. Some of it's designed to be a little bit wind pollinated, but it also hedges its bets and provides pollen and nectar for bees at that very, very earliest time. Um, willow, and most, most of the native willows are shrubby. 
um, which actually look quite good. You know, don't get out of control and, and drop twigs and get in your septic systems um, like the weeping willow, which is not native, or black willow, which frankly just doesn't look that good. Um, so think about shrubby willows. It's the shrubby, um, um, now we're getting into shrubs, but like uh, shrubby dogwoods, like um, alternate leaved and red osier and um, uh, and there's several other species which I can't recall right now. No, that's great. And uh, just to put in a plug for this, the city of Bowie has a tree program. So if you're interested in having one of the, a number of these native species are available through our program. So um, when I send the follow-up email with some of these resources, I'll send a link to that program as well. Great. Um, um, Steve is asking, okay, if I had to select one or two plant species to benefit, you know, a whole host of bees, which ones would mm. be the most important? Oh my God, that's so difficult to say. I think <laughs> If you want something that um, is really a long bloom season, easy to take care of, to, re totally resistant to deer, I would look at the mountain mints. So there's a variety of different ones. Narrow leafed is low, maybe a foot and a half. Um, and um, uh, I can't, broad leaved, I think it's called. Um, Muticum is the species name. Um, it's pretty widely available, uh, grows about three feet, and it's just it forms this really uniform, um, beautiful smelling um, growth of plants, and there's just tons of action on it. So that's a really good supportive uh, plant. The Monardas um, are also good, Oswego tea. Um, you know, there's just a, a real, just an incredibly long list of like shrubby St. John's wort is in bloom right now. So I'm thinking about it, has tons of things um, going on. It makes a great hedge plant. Um, uh, yeah, hard to, hard to really pin it down. The perennial sunflowers are also really nice. Yeah. What about bee balm? Is that the Monarda? Mm -hmm. That's the Monarda. Yep. And you can have different kinds. So the scarlet one is really um, geared more towards hummingbirds because that's why it's, so bees don't see red, hummingbirds do see red. That's why it's a red plant because it's designed to be more pollinated by hummingbirds than by bees. So then I don't have that variety because mine is not red. <laughs> yeah. And so that other one is more of a generalist um, plant. It's, it's, um, you know, closely related to um, the mountain mints and um, lots of different bees, particularly bumblebees are, it's a great attraction for bumblebees, but other species too, you know, beards, tongues, uh, you know, in the spring, you have all the woodland plants that you can put into your shady areas where you planted those trees years ago. And um, yeah, it's, uh, we, we don't have it ready yet, but um, um, we put together a list of good solid bee plants for the region, um, but someone is working it up into something that's presentable. So we'll, we'll have that and we'll have it out on our, you can see our, um, we have Facebook pages and Instagrams and Tumblrs. The Facebook page is where information like that would go out. And um, so feel free to sign up to that group. Cool. Thank you. Also, um, I'll, I'll, oh, no, you go. Me, I'll just say that the Instagram account, if you want to follow that, that's where we spend a lot of time getting into detailed stories about bees using some of our super detailed um, bee pictures. But that's where you can learn some of this really arcane stuff that fascinates us. Cool. Um, I had a question really quick before I answer Bob's other question, um, or ask it to you. Um, I thought a lot of perennials were deer resistant. Are they not? Oh, did he freeze? I think he might've frozen. Anthony, do you happen to know what's going on? Well, yeah, oops. I think his internet connection froze. Oh no. Okay. Um, well, purple bee balm. Oh, thank you, Liz. Um, so to answer Bob's question, Bob asked, what is Bowie's plan to grow, oh, to grow native uh, bee-friendly flowers? And um, it's a work in progress. It's, you know, there's a, a lot of different um, 
entities or de departments involved. So, you know, it's an evolving conversation. As you, some of you may know, we have the green team, um, one subgroup in particular, the natural resources subgroup, they work on putting in monarch way stations. So they work with staff to get that approved and to set out the area and the plan. And they work with Sam to grow seed. Um, and they, they plant these, these monarch way stations that have a lot of these plants in it. And um, it's a really great initi initiative. They have a new one coming up at Ken Hill Center, which you'll be able to walk through and see. So it'll be like a demo garden. Um, so Bob, stay tuned for that. It's a great, great question, but it's uh, evolving. Um, oh, thank you, Liz. <laughs> so um, I guess since um, he seems to have dropped off, we'll end it here. Um, I will send a follow-up email to you all with a lot of these resources and you can always reply to me with questions or reach out to Sam. I'll make sure I put his email in there as well. Um, so thank you all for attending and um, I'll follow up with you all shortly.